Welcome back to our third episode of The Weekend Strange. You're here with me, Timony, and I'm here with both my friends, Thomas and Jason. Um, once again, it has been another very long, strange week full of all kinds of things. Um, <laughs> we've had a lot of fun doing this show for you guys. Uh, thank you so much for showing up every week and tuning back in. Uh, it's been great fun to scrape the internet, uh, go down all kinds of rabbit holes, uh, dead ends, dark shadows, all kinds of things to see what we can find out there. Uh, once again, please, if you guys have any strange stories, uh, encounters, experiences, articles, um, go ahead and drop that stuff in the comment section because you never know what could be fodder for the for a future show. Um, so again, we sort of have kind of a, a stream going on and we never do this on purpose. It always just happens organically. Uh, so that's always very interesting. Um, so our first show um, is a headline from CBS News. And I'm just going to go ahead and read it for you. Um, it says, burst pipelines causes bubbling, steaming eye of fire to emerge in the Gulf of Mexico. It seems like something that could only appear in a movie. But on Friday, it was reality. The ocean was on fire. A gas leak west of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula broke out of an underwater pipeline, causing bright flames to appear to boil up to the Gulf of Mexico's surface and create what many describe as an eye of fire. Gas started leaking from the pipeline in the Campeche Sound at roughly 5.15 a.m. on Friday. According to a statement from the company that owns the pipeline, uh, Petróleos Mexicanos, otherwise known as Pemex. Um, that's pretty much all we get from the article. Uh, but I feel like there's something here that goes a little bit uh, below the surface. If you could say that. Uh, you know, ring of fire, eye of fire, things bubbling up from the, from the underworld, uh, which is, we've kind of talked about that a lot on here before. Um, any thoughts from you guys? Well, there's another one also happening in the Caspian Sea at the moment, uh, very similar. So are we dealing with some kind of dirt anomaly caused by the solar flare that's currently hitting the earth? Because it, they do, these solar flares do rupture uh, fissures and things like that and do cause earthquakes the one in the gulf of mexico i think that's also the primary spot where people believe that the dinosaur killing asteroid actually landed too in the uk in the yucatan right there so i don't know if that is a symbolic thing but it's just so surreal seeing that that fire burning in the water like that it's like you know there's something alchemical about it it's, it's so unnatural to see water on fire and again, do, you know, it, it, these th I tend to see things very much in auguries and portents and symbols. And there's, there's definitely that whole Gulf area. We have the, it's just funny that it was, I've been recently talking about the, the Deepwater Horizon explosion last week. And now this week in the same area, we have this explosion happening now. So it's um, like, it did, was that a foreshadowing thing? that I, I, did, I somehow detected that this thing was coming and then I made me talk about the Deepwater Horizon thing last week. It's in the same area. It's very peculiar, the whole thing. But uh, I'd be more inclined right now, and it's still important, actually it's fairly important. It, you know, we can look, we can look, we can talk about other aspects, metal, mythological and so on later. But with the, in tandem with the Caspian Sea one, that's, if that's happened now, I think it has that we could be dealing with uh, some air changes caused by the solar flare or going to get battered a bit. So are we, are we having a solar flare now during the solar minimum? Is that, is that where we're at? Yeah, yeah. there's an eruption happening. That's that a big one that's happening right now. Yeah. When are we supposed to get hit with that? I think it's happened already. We've been, it's, it's okay. been hit us yeah, already. I want to say there was an X class uh, yesterday or the day before, and that's, that's on the scale. They go, they go up in, uh, uh, I don't, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I know that X, I think is the highest. And then below that is M and they have numbers like a, like a earthquake would have like a, a you know, X two, I think is what it was. So it's a relatively big um, coronal mass ejection, I think is the term for it. But yeah, it, it does seem like if, you know, if this idea that our, our climate here, our earth changes on this planet are driven by solar activity that, yeah, when, once something comes out of the sun, it's going to uh, go into resonance with something within the planet, whether it's the core of the planet or whether it's it's some sort of network like a nervous system with all the uh, volcano tubes or or something to that extent that it goes in there and 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 um, 
and, and causes some changes within the earth, which are going to, you know, on the inside of it also show up on the outside, you know, just like as above, so below, as below, so above. If something underneath or underneath the crust, underneath the ocean, if that's becoming affected, we're going to start seeing it, you know, bubble out onto the surface. And, you know, I know you mentioned, Thomas, you mentioned about the, uh, on Twitter about the BP uh, disaster. You made that really nice kind of tribute post about Ian R. Crane and his, his story about it, it was almost as if there was some sort of living entity down there. And whether that is, you know, if we're talking about this in mythological terms, or we're saying that there actually is a, um, you know, a living being that our earth is, and it, you know, could be bleeding a little bit right now by oozing out these, uh, you know, if, if the pressure changed in this pipeline and suddenly there's just a ton more natural gas coming out, like, a, you know, just like we've got regulators on our, on our gas lines coming into our homes, I would imagine there's some, there may be some, uh, something to that extent on these uh, natural gas wells out there in the ocean that if it just blows that, that regulator, it's just going to cause something like this to occur. Well, that post was interesting. I didn't actually do that. Someone had heard me and had uh, basically transposed what I'd said on, said in, uh, in, uh, you know, on the show and put it into kind of like a meme. And it's just so, str- and the meme is really popular. We've seen like the amount of hits it's got. It's been spread all over the place. And it's definitely affected people uh, that, 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 that statement I made in the meme form. And then literally the week later, we get this. Now, I don't believe these things are always an accident or a coincidence. I believe that we do have elements of foreshadowing in this. So this would make me, and I'm also going to mention something about the psychic weather report. I'll mention it sure there. Uh, regarding the sea, that has me now thinking about, is there something going to manifest from the oceans that may be significant in the scheme of things? I don't know why. But uh, in fact, a friend of mine in America, a well-known s- singer, sent me, and you're not going to believe this, Timony, that video of the thing going up in the Gulf of Mexico, and she wrote, uh, Cthulhu Who Rises. And look at your t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, it's just what, it's what happens. It's what happens when we do this together. I don't know why, but it does. Uh, synchronicities are off the charts lately and it, it really does seem like we're tapping into some sort of common thread here which i imagine you know as as we go along throughout the show we're going to go through kind of um seasons of there being a particular theme that goes up and then we're going to go into something else and we're, we'll kind of follow a, a current like that as if as if we're you know on the ocean you know riding out the waves but right now we're getting this wave here with all these earth changes things and you know the next thing that comes along we're going to start seeing uh, auguries and portents of of you know, the next um, collective uh, unconscious wave hitting us. You know, it'd be interesting to look back, you know, once we've done a whole year of these, it'd be interesting to see uh, the picture that has been woven throughout the year. If we can see those ebbs and flows and those uh, those stories that all tie together. And Yeah, like you know, a journal, it's going to be very useful, I think. Yeah, yeah, like a psychic journal for sure. Oh. Well, uh, so our next story... Again, keeping with the skies as above, so below sort of thing. Um, This one's been around for a little while. Um, It's been talked about. It's come and gone. Um, The headline says, extremely eccentric mini planet approaches Earth for the first time in 600,000 years. Uh, There's some really cool photos. We'll make sure that we link those for you guys. Um, The article goes on to say, a miniature planet with a 600 thousand year long orbit will soon make its closest path to earth since the days of the caveman the space rock 2014 un 271 has already careened into the inner solar system and will reach its closest point to earth in 2031 let's draw some parallels to that here in just a minute the celestial body is too large to be a comet and too small to be classified as a planet according to the outlet which characterizes 2014 un 271 as extremely eccentric The object is already closer to the sun than Neptune, and in a decade, the space rock will be about the same distance as Saturn, according to the report. The last time 2014 UN271 was that close to Earth was 612, 190,000 years ago, the article said. Since then, it has spent most of its wild orbit in the Oort cloud, the outer portion of the solar system up to three light years away, which is influenced by the gravitational pull of both the sun and the passing stars in the Milky Way. The space rock is estimated to be 
uh, 62 to 230 miles wide, but its size is reportedly larger than any object recorded in the Oort cloud. Uh, that puts it on a similar scale, if not larger than Sarabat's huge comet C1729P1, and almost undoubtedly the largest Oort cloud object ever discovered, almost in dwarf planet territory. Uh, Sam Dean, he's a citizen astronomer. Uh, that was his comment. Um, as it gets closer to the sun, it's expected to develop the coma and tail of a comet as ice on its surface vaporizes from the star's heat. Uh, they go on to sort of compare it somewhat loosely to Pluto. Um, yeah, that's interesting that they, they mentioned the whole, the, the comet and the tail vaporizing because that uh, had to do with our noctilucent clouds, which they said were basically uh, vaporized. Uh, Meteorites. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I, don't know, I, I don't know about anyone else, but hearing uh, eccentric planets and coming from the Oort cloud puts the willies up me. And, uh, you know, eccentric seems like a very uh, loaded term. I mean, basically, we can't, we can't control or understand it. And uh, it, as it gets closer to the Earth, we were talking about this with Ben in the previous show, it's going to melt and it's going to be outgassing. Now, this thing, this thing has a wacky orbit. Uh, this could pro and we don't know what how it would be changed by Jupiter's gravity pull and so on. It's another one of these things that we're living in remarkable times. It's like every single day there seems to be news that, that blows my mind, and this is just more of it. I don't, I, I do, I am concerned about the use of language though, e extremely uh, what do they say, unusual, erratic, or eccentric. Eccentric, yeah. Now, eccentric, when you think about it, is I think the, the real meaning of that term is to deviate from a circle, uh, to deviate from a fixed path. I think that's what eccentric actually means. And so that's, you know, these people drop each other a little clues in the media. They, won't, they wouldn't say an unusual object. They said eccentric, meaning it would actually deviate from its, its, its orbital trajectory. And, you know, the, the effects of Kepler... Uh, might have a sudden change if there was, you know, some major outgassing or effects broken up by the gravity of Jupiter. It's 200 odd miles long. Now, this thing is pretty big. Whatever grabs hold of that gravitationally will, will grab hold of it. So uh, one definitely to watch out for. And uh, that's nothing this large has ever been seen in, that we know of coming out of the Oort cloud. And 600,000 years ago this is a long time to actually kind of gauge if it had a previous effect on the planet. But I'll tell you one thing, this one is going to be one, this will be like an a, a Uma Uma. This will be one that I'm going to be keeping my eyes well peeled on. Yeah, yeah. we've had a lot of those kind of, if you want to call them Nibiru-esque type, you know, things approaching the Earth. We've had the Dark Knight satellite. We've had a Mua Mua. We've got this guy. Um, yeah, there just, there seems to be something going on up around above us that I'm not sure what we're supposed to think about that, but it's something to pay attention to. And that's what that's what keeps grabbing me about this. Like we we already mentioned the language around it, and I see a lot of real. Um, th there's definitely some kind of linguistic manipulation going on here. I think I said it in the last episode that it wouldn't surprise me if the uh, merchants of fear, <laughs> the media, whoever is behind that media selling us the the stories, if they are aware of some kind of natural cycle and they're they're pushing some kind of agenda to make it look a certain way. And with this, I just keep seeing there's, there's these dates that always seem to be reappearing for a while. Uh, like a decade ago, I remember I was looking into the whole agenda 21 thing. And that was, you know, that was in conspiracy theory world around like 2012. And then that actually, you know, is something you can go and look about uh, agenda 21 and whatever they call it, like the plan for the new American, whatever. And the next thing they, they keep coming into is like, what, there's supposed to be an agenda 2030 thing. And there's just that thing they, they mentioned in this uh, 2031 so it just, it just, yeah, it just seems like there these, these dates are loaded with significance. And as you're mentioning, Thomas, like they, they communicate with each other by the way, you know, the way they fire their cannons, you know, there, there's just the, these little loaded linguistic um, bombs in there. And it's just, it's interesting to see that, that, you know, there's this sensationalism uh, appearing around all this as if we're just suddenly discovering it. But I would imagine like, you know, they've known about, we've, we've all known about this shit for a long time, you know, it's written about in, you know, different uh, mythology and, you know, different, it's all over the place, but, you know, they're, they're capitalizing on it. The merchants of fear are. Well, the thing is with this, uh, 
uh, these things like the dark, Timony mentioned a dark night satellite, Uma Uma, and now this thing. Uh, we've had the technology to actually find these things a long time now. I mean, radar telescopes have been knocking around for 80 years, and there's been plenty of deep space observational technologies for a good 50 years. Why now? You know, and why that, now? There's got to be a reason. Why now? Yeah. Yeah. With all the stuff you're saying, Thomas, too, like you're in your own ironicals, like what is this really about? You know, it, it's just the last year or so. It just to me, it seems like some sort of social engineering to push something. And I, I, I can't put my finger specifically on what it is, but but something is being pushed and people are people are being conditioned. You know, the, the, the vast majority of people we see out there are uh, following along with the social engineering that's being prescribed to them. Well, and these things could be bringing some sort of maybe not like an actual an actual extraterrestrial message that they're going to beam down towards us, but it, it, it could be affecting our consciousness in such a way, you know, it could be revealing a shadow, it could be uh, presenting a shadow, you know, we, we can't really say yet, but there's just something about the way that they show up. Um, well, if you look at Lovecraft, the aliens or the, 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 the beings, the beasts or whatever, the monsters don't actually kill it kill the protagonist he's destroyed by coming to terms with it or he commits suicide or he goes Some insane fear destroys him yeah and it's just like that what we're dealing with in the world today there's like there's no one actually being are they being killed by the c word and uh, not that c word dc word the pandemic c word or are they be in a Lovecraftian sense, you know, writing down, uh, this is my final moment of madness, I can no longer continue, this kind of thing. Is, this, is there a kind of a, 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 a subconscious, willing carousel a la Logan's Run moment for these people, where they, there's a new, a new reality coming or a new world coming, and they're simply checking out on a subconscious level because they're not ready for it. And we'll well, I think it's just going to come down to that. You know, I think at some point there's going to be a very strong fork in the road where either you can deal with the shit or you can't deal with the shit. Oh, I think we're already there. And I think yeah. a lot of them can't deal with the shit. And that's why I think even with all the stuff we're hearing about the needlecraft and they're still willing to embrace it is that kind of like. And willing uh, to die for it. I'll take that. This is what they're saying. I will take that over the possibility, like you said, of some body for, or some object or some comet from Pam Spermia type moment from outer space that will actually change human consciousness because we're done. We're done with this and we're checking out. I mean, I, I mean, when this thing first started, I said it's, it looks like a Doctor Who episode. It's even more like a Doctor Who episode every day. Yeah, it's just, I, I, it's just, it's just amazing that, like, yeah, there there are people losing their shit about this, but at the same time, there there's <laughs> I don't want to toot my own horn here, but there's the alchemists like us who are taking these opportunities, and you know, we wouldn't be here on the show right now, the three of us talking, if there hadn't been something that you know got a Gus going on a trajectory. You and me, Thomas, with Libra Velocity and the short films bringing Timothy on, it's like we're 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 picking up on whatever it is too but we're taking it and transmuting it into something beautiful into something you know an emerging mythology we're taking it and uh, processing it rather than compartmentalizing it away until it you know explodes out our out of our out of our chest like <laughs> like like out of uh, the alien film you know yeah yeah so we, we brought into understanding yeah so we can get a clear picture no matter what it is I, i'm not and, and I really do believe that all the stuff that's going on, and I, I, I know this, I know the Christians with their end time thing, so love to see signs and they love to see all this stuff. As a pagan, I don't believe there's an end. I believe the things start over again. And that's, I think, what's probably keeping us in the frame that we're in, is that we have a belief that, no, it's just it's, it's, it's just the beginning of a new system. And I think it could even come down to as simple of a thought process as... Um, humans we're, we're programmed to not we want to stay in what's comfortable in the things that we know the places we're comfortable with the things that are known so once you are brave enough or bold enough or just you know make a conscious choice to step out of something that you know you don't want to be a part of anymore there's going to be a part of your old programming your old processing that's going to tell you even though we know we don't want to go back there and it's fucked up and we don't like it like that's what we know. So let's just go there. So there has to be this like almost dualistic uh, point where you can think two things at the same time and, and not, uh, what do they call that? Cognitive 
uh, dissonance or whatever, not, not in that way, but just to know where you can take a look at what you're thinking and say, I, I know that what's happening is a process in me that wants to go back to what's known. But the bigger part of me knows that all of this weird stuff that's happening around me and making me feel uncomfortable, uh, putting me into places I've never been before. I'm having to make choices I've never made before. Uh, that's a huge step forward in evolutionary consciousness. And it really could come down to something just as simple as being able to sit down with yourself and realize that these two things are happening and then make a choice. Yep. And then all of the things like epigenetics, changing your DNA to deal with any kind of planetary changes or atmospheric changes. It right. I mean, and, yeah, we could go down that whole path too yeah. with, with all the things that are being pushed on you to where if you did make that choice, maybe your body wouldn't be able to be compatible with that stuff anymore. Yeah, I mean, all the options are on the table, and I, I want, I want, I want to see all the options on the table rather than to hide my eyes from the table. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Table's a good place to be. <laughs> Anything else to say about that, you guys? That that's that was a really good conversation. I think we kind of hashed that one out good. I think we nailed that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to continue right. on to this next one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, Thomas, we found this one for you specifically. We knew you would really like this. Um, so the headline reading lightning red jellyfish in the sky, uh, USA, a hurricane hunter photographed a rare red lightning that looks like a giant jellyfish floating in the, in the sky above Kansas state. Hurricane hunter, Michael Gavin from Bethune, Colorado captures bright red lightning that lights up the sky. According to Gavin, while chasing a tornado in the area, he saw irregular lightning appearing in Northwestern Kansas. When the sky is clear, a large cluster of red jellyfish-shaped lightning flashes. These bright jellyfish lightning bolts are easily visible to the naked eye in the evening light. Irregular lightning, usually red, is a large-scale electrical discharge that occurs high above the thunderstorm cloud. This type of lightning usually occurs in clusters at an altitude of 50 to 90 kilometers. Similar to normal lightning, irregular lightning lasts only in the sky for less than a second. Due to the speed and location of formation, irregular lightning is difficult to record. Irregular lightning may become more prominent because the sun is currently in its minimum phase, according to spaceweather.com. This is the period when the sun is at least active, is the least active in its 11 year cycle. Its magnetic field becomes weaker in the minimum phase, allowing cosmic rays from deep space to easily enter the solar system without being affected. Previous studies have found that cosmic rays can promote the formation of irregular lightning by creating electrical pathways in the atmosphere. And these photos are amazing. So we'll definitely get those linked down below. And, and they do, they look like, it reminds me, what was that movie, The Arrival? <clears throat> it kind of reminds me of that, except they're red. Yeah, no, th this is real interesting. Again, it's just, it's going on with this theme about something from outside exciting the atmosphere or exciting um, the magnetic, uh, uh, the, the magnetosphere to create these, these uh, aerial phenomena again, not, not the, uh, the UAP stuff, but the, you know, these kind of Northern lights, uh, octolucent, oct noctilucent clouds and these strange atmospheric phenomena that maybe are, uh, our uh, ancestors from from aeons ago, when the last um, change happened, they were seeing these these manifestations up in the sky and looking at them and like painting them in rock art. And, uh, you know, just like what uh, Jeff Woolwine was talking about, like they saw something and, you know, they're not necessarily uh, what they appear to be, but they're definitely something. And these people have experienced it, you know, and uh, the people that lived in Kansas last time around, they probably saw them. We could probably go underground there and, and find a, a painting or a, uh, you know, something, something depicting petroglyphs or something. Yeah, petroglyphs. Yeah. Whatever it was, it had mass to it. Because if you look at the picture, it, it's fingers coming down. If you ever see an airborne explosion, like a jet fighter blown up in the sky, it comes down and are bombs that are blown up in the air. They come, they come down on fingers like this thing. So that, that suggests mass. That suggests there was actually a weight to it. There was some atomic weight to it. And when it came down from space, it actually plummeted through the earth in that area. And I, I, there should immediately be some kind of scientific investigation of what's landed in that area where it's come down, if they can find it. Another thing that struck me with, about it was the color of it. The U is very, very deep. It's, not, it's barely translucent. It's quite opaque. And it's very, very red. And it's very strong. So this thing, the agency of that color 
whatever whatever it is, like a gas or something. I don't know what gas creates red. I know remember the old fashioned lasers they used to fire them through a gas, and the gas made the gas made the laser light red. Whatever that was, it wasn't in the upper atmosphere. The whole thing came down with mass and also came down with some kind of compound that actually or some kind of gas that caused that red effect to happen. Because it certainly wasn't plasma, I don't think. I think they're just guessing that one. It's from space. There's no doubt about that. It's coming down. Uh, has this one been seen before? No, I have a. I, I was going through my, my head here, thinking back. I can't remember that one ever being reported or seen before. So it's a brand new one, and um, it, you know, it's like you said. It's funny you said it's like the, those octopusy things in Arrival. Uh, is is that movie? Some was that movie? Well, they weren't even octopus. They had seven legs. Remember. Was that? Uh, what were they? Cephalopods yeah. or something like that? Yeah, yeah. And you know, so they this that was interesting how they made that distinction between. I didn't really like that movie that much, except for that part. But um, the the uh, the uh, it was that a foreshadowing of this event? Are we going to see more of them? Are we, you know, again, you, we should look at some. We talk about looking at old ancient cave art or me- Mesoamerican art to see if we can find anything. But uh, this is a new one. I've never seen anything like this. But whatever it is, it has mass and density. It has an atomic weight and a carried with the agency in order to create that color. So it's almost like we were hit with something that was uh, serious. A bit, and uh, it almost looks like ink. It, it looks like red ink. Yeah, it's very, it's very opaque. It's really weird. Yeah, yeah. It's dribbling down from the clouds almost. Which again is interesting because of how in, in that movie, uh, when they were communicating, you know, the type of language, it was like an ink blotter. Yeah. Type they, deal, and they yeah, would just like spit it really. and then it would like kind of fall down. Yeah. Uh, that's what gets me. That's just the, the intensity of it. Yeah. That's just not something you see, really especially is. against the, the black of the night, you know, like and the dark blue skies, like the, and then there's just this bright red spot that just doesn't look like it. Goes I mean, I, I was joking to myself the other day. We could call this to show the the day and strange things are happening so fast. But now it's going to be called the hour and strange. And yeah, are, the second and strange. You know, and uh, the, the, that yeah, I mean, another one of these watch this space thing. If anybody out there has any aware of any red ochre artwork, particularly in Mesoamerican artwork, Aborigine that might suggest this thing, show it. You know. I, I think I've even seen the Aboriginal Australian artwork that showed octopi in the middle of the desert. And that was always a, a mystery. What, how, did the, how did they see octopuses in the middle of the desert? Well, maybe they saw this thing and that's why they painted it. So this is definitely a really good uh, cul-de-sac, not cul-de-sac, but rabbit hole to go charging down. I think, I think it will be very fruitful digging into the story further. It really is color out of space. Yeah, and yeah. you... And you, and you, and you uh, reviewers and watchers of the show remember you're part of this uh, our, our research team too so you know dive in if you've seen things take photos if you find a story uh something happens locally please put it in the comment section we would love to you know it's it's hard for the three of us to always be able to search the entire internet there's there's no way that's going to happen so we'd love your help if, if you come across things let us know and if you have photos of something that you experience yourself photos or videos br313 at gmx.com. That's our email, br313 at gmx.com. If you yourself have seen red jellyfish or or something, anything, you know, if it's it's strange, send us a story, send us your videos and photos of it. We'll reply back. Thank you. The 14 hotline, brx, br313 at (laughs) gmx.com. And I will put this at the bottom of the video. Great idea, Jason. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Tom, are you ready to take it away with the weather? Is it bad? Is it great? Are you happy? Are you irate? The week in psychic weather. This week's psychic weather is fish. The reason I started the psychic weather program was to look out for when things became intense, when things became dangerous and pathological in a social way. I often used and primarily used the psychic weather reports myself to see the behavioral changes in people. 
And since I've started this program, they've behaved very well. There hasn't been any flare ups of dangerous behavior, pathological ren fielding or anything that would suggest mass hysteria. Quite the opposite. There's been bewilderment and a kind of an oddness about their behavior. Well, this week, in the same way that the the weatherman on TV has a Doppler radar or in order to get to see the weather, I use my dreams. And this might be an interesting one for other people. This week, I have had two dreams, and the, sorry, three dreams, the, the, the last one today, of human beings turning into fish and becoming fish. And not only becoming fish, but they've been trained into becoming fish and being told to accept their fish life. And they willingly doing it. And I was not turned into a fish myself, but I was there observing it. And it was the, spe the specific type of Joe Normie, and G or Gene Normie, who was being turned into a fish. And they were becoming fish to go live in the sea. What does this mean? I don't know. Are we dealing with some kind of uh, reaction that I'm having towards their behavior during this whole seaward needlecraft? Or are we looking at a tsunami and large numbers of people being under the water? Uh, because, funny enough, uh, from friends of mine last weekend were having out of the blue discussions about tsunamis and how to survive them in case we had some kind of orbital change in the weather. And then I start having these dreams, and now we're hearing other things. So the week in psychic weather is this week, the same as usual as it has been for the last three weeks, bewilderment, but fishy. Is it bad? Is it great? Are you happy? Are you irate? The week in psychic weather. Thank you, Thomas. That was a great report. Uh, something that I, I had wanted to bring up earlier, and it just seems to kind of fit in right with what we were talking about and also your report. Um, did you ever see a movie? And it's, it's an older one, I want to say, maybe like later 80s. It was called The Last Wave. Yeah. Did you see that one? Is that the one about they're all waiting on the beach in uh, Australia? Yeah, they're Aborigines and they have all yeah. of the, the petroglyphs and the cave art and they're waiting for the tsunami yeah, to come. That's nearly early 70s. Richard Chamberlain is in it. Richard Chamberlain. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So early 70s. Yeah. It's a yeah. classic, but I haven't seen it since I was a child. It's been a very long time since I've seen it too, but there was just a couple of things that we had talked about uh, that reminded me of it. Um, and then with just a few of the other things that you had said about surviving tsunamis and and all that, I just, I, I figured I'd throw that out there for people if they're looking for a movie to watch. Um, it'd be a good one to watch right about now. Well, one of the reasons this came up uh, about the tsunami survival thing is that we were both kind of interested in who, how to survive a tsunami. And the, the Japanese tsunami of a few years back, and the, the really bad one, the Fukushima one, and then the Phuket one in Indonesia uh, and Sri Lanka. And I was in the spot in Sri Lanka where the tsunami hit, and they survived. Uh, the ones who survived were not in, in anything. So most of the people who died were in their cars or in their trains or in trains and things, buses uh, or in, in, in their houses. And in Japan, most of them died in their cars because the water froze the electronic car locks. They couldn't get out the doors and they were, they were trapped inside. But there was numerous stories of people who were caught up in the wave, both in Indonesia and Sri Lanka and in Thailand and in the recent one in Japan, and just went with the flow. And just yeah. if they were lucky that nothing impaled them or they got hit, landed, hit, smashed against the wall and something hit them, they just were carried up. And some of them were old folks. And then they let themselves float back out to sea and eventually they were able to hang on to something to be rescued or to paddle ashore. So I always I thought that was kind of also not only a good survival thing, but also an interesting metaphor that we're talking about on the theme of this show, if these air changes are coming, to go with the flow rather than to try and resist them. Exactly. Yeah. I like that. Kind of Jason, have to become anything? A, I was going to say you kind of have to become a fish. <laughs> yeah. Damn it. <laughs> it's too good to be true. 
Okay, this one I, I thought was really funny. Well, not funny, but interesting. I, I like the, the title of it, um, A Flock Circle. <laughs> so, something out of the X-Files. Hundreds of sheep assemble a mysterious flock circle in a UK field. A 47-year-old who was a lecturer at Royal Holloway University in London said he goes past the sheep every day and they are usually very noisy. A huge flock of sheep has caused a stir after being spotted standing in a bizarre concentric circle in a field in East East Sussex, the UK. Christopher Hogg, the man who spotted the never-seen-before phenomenon while out on his bike in Rottingdean, said he initially thought it was a spaceship. These photos are amazing, by the way. Hogg shared photos of the unusual spectacle on Facebook, following which many users said it actually looked like an alien ship. It was on my daily cycle when I came over the hill and saw this magnificent circle. At that point, I was about half a mile away, which made me think that whatever it was, it was huge. It was saucer shaped like an alien ship. Hogg was quoted as saying by Jams Press. It was beautiful, but also in 2021, a bit too weird for comfort. I cycled closer and closer and then realized the circle was were made of sheep. Uh, The 47-year-old, who was a lecturer at Royal Holloway University in London, said he goes past the sheep every day, and they're usually very noisy. But on this occasion, they were still and very calm. It was so quiet, like they were in a trance. It was very eerie, he said. Hogg showed the photos he had taken to his wife and son, who were both shocked by the flock circle. After he shared the photos on Facebook, several users tried tried to figure out what caused such a rare sight. There was lots of debate whether it was a crop or flock circle or if it was the sheep were being summoned by a strange horse. Others thought they might be pranking the farmer. We all agreed it was a mystery that warranted the recall of Mulder and Scully. (laughs) So there's a bit of strangeness and a bit of humor, uh, which always goes a long way. Well, sheep are stupid bastards. They're the stupidest animal in the world. They're so cute, but they are so I've seen them walk off cliffs. If one walks off a cliff here, the other ones behind them go, and they will walk off the cliff and plunge, all plunge to their deaths. They're just, this is where we call humans who don't think and follow the sheep. That's, that's the reason why. Now, it, this could have a, we could have a situation here where there was something in the grass that maybe even the farmer put down in a circle and one to two sheep start following and sniffing it. I don't know. And then the rest of them just, just randomly followed it. Uh, that's that's what I would think because that's what they're like. They're really stupid. And another one is that, um, and they're nasty bastards as well. They 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 all they they're nasty. They're not. I don't like them. And um, another one is um, I saw I a circle of rotating um, what you call those things in America? Wild turkeys, and they were all going around the road. Turns around there was a hormone that they all was left in a circle or somehow ended in a circle. And they were following this hormone uh, for the same reason. So, I mean, okay, e- look at, here's how I tend to look at things, right? Even if that was a practical joke of, by a farmer to get the sheep rotating in circles, it has a 40 and echo with the behavior of human beings right now regarding needlecraft and the whole hysteria of the moment. Well, that's what he said. Even if, even if it's a joke for 2021, it's still too weird. <laughs> yeah, and too appropriate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sheep circle, the you know, uh, sheeple. Yep. Uh, all of that. Yeah. Another another aspect I tend to look at when I see groups of animals all behaving as one entity is that idea that sometimes when there's a disincarnate entity around. Uh, little little you know flocks of little birds or whatever it is uh, schools of fish will move it'll use the disincarnate entity you know consciousness and and life force has to have a body to inhabit whether it's just a body of light or a physical meat body or a group of animals a group of fish whatever that perhaps you know some sort of intelligence was moving through that you know very 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 uh, unintelligent dumb group of animals but again that, that's that's just you know my conjecture there that sort of like a very easy ship to commandeer yeah very, very easy ship to commandeer yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh it comes with a full crew yeah. someone should put music to it <laughs> yeah flock <laughs> circle yeah some very nice orchestral music but something very hypnotic a hypnotic oh, waltz. Dance, it'd be dance music i saw this one of like these muslim guys and they're all dancing and someone put uh uh, Lutretia um, by the Sisters of Mercy and going din, 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 and all the Muslims <laughs> <laughs> that like driving bass yeah. 
Yeah, or you know, just some you know death metal that would work too. <laughs> Flock circle. That's what I'll call it. Flock circle. That was Flock good. circle. Good name for a band. Yeah. Totally. So that's our band's name. <laughs> that's our next project coming soon. Okay, you guys. Um, uh, have, we haven't really talked about harp on here too much. I'm assuming for the most part, everybody knows what that is. We'll give a brief rundown just in case uh, anybody here's not heard of harp. It stands for high rural, high active auroral research project. It's a big laser beam they have up in Alaska. They shoot up into the atmosphere to try and affect changes. So this just came out. It's, it's a little bit, well, it came out in April, uh, but it says UAF lands $9.3 million grant to expand research at HARP. A uh, National Science Foundation grant will allow the University of Alaska Fairbanks to expand its activities at the High Frequency Active Arroyal Research Program in Gakona. That is really hard to say out loud really fast. The U.S. military built HARP in the 1990s for $290 million to conduct ionospheric research related to communications, navigation, surveillance, and other applications. But in 2015, the Air Force ended the program and turned the HARP facility over to the University of Alaska Fairbanks. UAF has since operated it sporadically for government and independent clients. We've been charging a little over $5,000 an hour to use the facility, UAF Geophysical Institute Director Bob McCoy said but we haven't had very many hours, so it's been costing us quite a bit. McCoy says five, says five year $9.3 million grant from the National Science Foundation will enable the, the university to maintain the heart facility and expand operations. Now we, can op now we can open it up fully and invite in people to use it. So it's really a big deal for us. McCoy says the heart station is the most powerful of the three ionospheric research facilities on the planet. It uses hundreds of high frequency radio transmitters and antennas to probe the ionosphere. Uh, he goes on to say, it's a tool that will be increasingly valuable for scientific experiments involving the auroras as, a solar as the solar cycle peaks. The next four or five years, the ionosphere should get a lot more exciting. You should see in the winter, a lot more dynamic aurora. Can you see a full circle? Yeah. <laughs> Harp is also useful as a remote sensing tool. An application, McCoy says, is in demand as the Arctic warms and countries buy for control of it. We can actually look north several hundred miles from Alaska, and we can study the ocean. We can measure sea ice. We can look for aircraft or ships out in the Arctic Ocean. Harp can transmit, say, to the north, reflect off the ionosphere down to the sea ice, and you pick up that signal again, either with an antenna or a satellite. Uh, McCoy says... A separate grant will provide a million dollars to build and locate a LIDAR instrument at the HARP site for study of other parts of the upper atmosphere. That together with other instrumentational UAF plans to relocate to the HARP site will make up what's being called the sub arroyal Geophysical Observation for Space Physics and Radio Science. Well. <laughs> yeah, whenever I see anything about HARP and the way they try to explain it, it always just seems like it's really played down um, you know, they, there's, there's, if you want to say there's a cover story there about what it's used for, but the, the thing that always comes into mind for me with harp is some sort of, uh, you know, weapon it's, it's gotta be, you know, they're, they're using it for something, you know, if, if the military, uh, put that much money into it, it wasn't merely for research for the sake of taking notes down in a notebook with a bunch of nerds, like the research they're doing for it, what I imagine would be for using as, you know, some kind of weather manipulation technology, and I think it was, uh, what's his name, Ben with uh, Suspicious Observers, right before we had the heat wave, uh, was it last week, that there was a, a yeah. uh, FAA, I forgot what it's called, but there's an FAA thing that went out uh, from HARP saying to not fly over that motherfucker, <laughs> you know, uh, to not fly over right. HARP last week. And then sure enough, you know, here we had unprecedented heat, you know, it's cooled down since then. It's like typical weather right now for the summer but that those well, and i'll tell you it was very strange because we went from 118 degrees and then the very next day we were back down to 70 and right. that was not in the forecast we were supposed to gradually go down from like 118 to 109 103 you know 98 yeah. whatever and then it was like <clears throat> the brakes screeched and we yep. went from 118 to 70 degrees yeah with with no thunderstorms like like when you typically get a 
you know, a lot of hot weather, you know, you'll have a thunderstorm there as it starts to cool down and it'll slowly come down. Like you said, this is just a massive wind storm, but it only lasted maybe two or three hours. And that was it. Yeah. Just from the quick, sudden uh, temperature change. And then here too, like uh, I think a few of us were talking on Facebook. It's just like the way that our, um, our plants, our, our rose bushes, our crops, just the, the cellular damage done to them, like out on, on the, uh, the north side of my my property here, the, the the damage that was done on some of the plants just looked like they got microwaved. They were like the just totally destroyed. And you know, back here on the other side of the house, the rose bushes are fine and everything, but it just totally, totally messed up a bunch of people's plants. Um, people down in Portland were talking about it, but it really wouldn't surprise me if they were like like you said in the article. They they use it you know to bounce something off of the atmosphere, and then they say, oh well, we can read something over here. By bouncing that it's like well yeah but if you can if you can send energy like that from one source reflect it over to another it'd be like you know the kid with his magnifying glass you know taking the, the focus of the sun and zapping a bunch of ants something to that extent i would imagine and, and uh you know maybe that's what was going on last week well I, i'm old enough to remember that if you mentioned harp you are the ultimate tinfoil hat conspiracy loon uh, you were. This was like the the most unspoken. Thou shall not speak its name in public. Harp, you're a nutcase. That thing isn't real. And that was that lasted well into the two thousands. I might add. Now the in the I first heard about it, and there used to be a a, bo- a disclosure thing of black ops projects that was released every year in the United States, and Mother Jones magazine used to feature it. And the first time I heard of, and they used to publish a, a small book as well, a booklet. And I, I'm, the first time I ever heard of Harp was in that booklet. And the whole thing at the time was its implications for ecological and environmental damage. There was concerns about that damaging the migration or causing suicides of whales, forest gones on fire. And there was even great fears of the atmosphere itself actually bursting into flames and going on fire. And now it's accepted, oh, we have harp. What? You know, and the people who, the same ones, the same pieces of shit who slagged me off years ago saying that thing isn't real. Don't, don't apologize. You know, they just like, they talk about it. Oh yeah, I heard about that thing. It's just a communication system. I mean, it was so absurd that even when it was supposed to be top secret, you could actually pick up the frequency on your shortwave radios. And you spoke there about the, the, the weird sun that like roasted up where you lived right before that thing was fired up. Here, everybody on the same weekend got a really bad sun sh- sunburn from regular sunshine, including myself, a very bad instantaneous sunburn that was almost like you'd opened an, a bread oven and stood in front of it, uh, even though the sun wasn't particularly hot, but everyone got a really bad sunburn. This may also explain the, the bizarre, bizarre and strange behaviors of birds. And uh, this, you know, this is a strange thing. This is something that I don't like it at all. I don't, you know, it's one thing that the United States has this machine. It's another thing that it's affecting the entire planet. How this sits in international treaties and so on. If, you know, how it affects, it's got, like how direct, direct, directionable is it? And the fact that they're pumping money into it again after all these years and being open about it again sets off my red flag. So what the hell is going on? Uh, uh, there seems to be a multi-spectrum attempt to, to, to augment reality on this planet in all kinds of ways at the same time. Not just gaslighting in the media, but also through pharmacology, through social habits, through the changes in our cultures to everything, including this, things like this. And um, this is it. I mean, this is, this is the, this, the, it's showtime. That's the only way I can, I can put this, and this is for the proof of it. And just like our first story, we t- I think it was our first story last week or the week before, but about the, uh, the energy weapons, you know, people, people being targeted. Uh, was that the first week or was that last week we talked about it? Oh, that was last week. Whenever we, yeah, last week. But that idea of of this kind of same kind of thing of of directed energy weapons on people, you know, and and now it's like, yeah, they're they're saying that Harp, we're firing it up again now, and you know, all the MK Ultra type stuff, the stuff we talked about with David Oman, and um, uh, the effects that a lot of uh, um, 
electromagnetic radiation can have on the human psyche to incite uh, schizophrenic type symptoms within people. And I imagine, you know, whatever it is that harp can um, emit from it, you, know, you could probably do that same kind of uh, psychological warfare on people with it besides just uh, zapping them like a, um, you know, like we we're just talking about Thomas, you're saying opening up a bread oven and getting the, the radiation off of it. But the same kind of thing, I imagine they could use it uh, for uh, electromagnetic radiation, just, just pumping people with magnetism or, or messing with the, 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 uh, the magnetics in a local, um, in a local area, something like that to, to, to cause some kind of, um, you know, like, like the uh, Philadelphia experiment, but on, <laughs> on a group of people. Yes. I would just like to interject there. One more thing I'd like to throw into the soup pot on this is that in recent weeks, there's been photographs of ships hovering above the sea. I posted a, an article about the, my something about this in the Beyond Room 313 Facebook group, which everyone should be on. And these the ships are hovering above the sea in photographs. And they were seen and also photographed that way. Very clear and distinct. Now, this was immediately said to be a Fata Morgana, which is an optical illusion caused by the rays of bending around the, the curvature of the earth. And I said, okay, fair enough. That, I'll take that at face value. That seemed, I've never seen one. Well, there was a very interesting letter in 40 and Times, the recent edition, where someone said that's absolute rubbish. A, a Fata Morgana, Morgana distorts and bends the image. These ships are crystal clear. There's no distortion to their shape or colors or anything. And it's an other, it's some other kind of effect. Now, so I was on the internet in the last few days looking up traditional pictures of Fata, Fata Morgana. And yes, everything's twist, twisted and bent and wrecked by the, by the effect even though you can say, I can say it's a ship, but it's all wobbly and bend and round at the edges. Is it kind of like the same effect when you look over a really hot street on a hot day? Yeah, where it, similar it, kind of thing, but it's caused, okay. it's, it happens with, it's, it's, I believe it's ice crystals in the atmosphere. But same kind of visual effect? Well, no, it actually causes ships to float up in the air. It looks like they're floating. Oh, in, okay. But, they're, okay. They're, but they're, they're usually bad, bad images. They're usually bad. These pictures that are coming out in recent weeks, the ships are crystal clear. Like as if they really are floating. In. So it's not distorted. You'll see that in the group when you, when the show is over and have a look at it. So is this, is this also part of the carp thing, this distortion of reality and perception or, or whatever's going on in the world right now? But uh, like one of the things I've had lots of rows over the years with the, the flat air folks, but one of the things that they have shown is that there's tremendous photographic anomalies show up when they shouldn't. And they and this thing of optical illusions or Fata Morgana is including one that one guy stood on the on the coast of Cumbria in England where Jade is and took footage of the Isle of Man beach, which should have been able to. That's true. It should have been below the horizon. But not only that, clearly visible beyond that was the mountains of Ireland uh, in Northern Ireland. So this was giving a double whammy of a strange atmospheric effect. Now, these guys were saying this is proof that the Earth is flat, but it didn't really because the ones in the Northern Ireland Mountains were obviously, they're much taller than the Isle of Man, but they were lower. So they were definitely receding over the curve. But it also reminded my experience that I told you about where we saw the whole of the Dublin Bay and England and everything in perfect clarity one day, that reality is subjective, that you can actually see strange things that shouldn't be seen and if this is part of this this shift we're going through or it's harp or something but I, I encourage people to go to the beyond room 313 group and look at this thread those ships are crystal clear and floating in the air so it's, it's some it's some quantum effect and Did another one think? to look out before sorry another to me before we look out one of the yep. observable quantum effects that we can actually determine is that the moon is much bigger when it gets to the horizon it's gigantic we've all seen this right that that's i was told when i was growing up that was because the earth acts like a lens or something it's a completely unknown phenomenon of why the moon gets gigantic at the horizon and the only one the, the most plausible explanation outside the ones that i haven't believed is it's a quantum effect I, I think we should start watching the moon rises and the moon settings. I think so. Uh, I just wanted, as you were talking, something 
came into my mind real quick when you were talking about mountains appearing. Um, hi, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. Is it High Brazil or High Brazil? Yeah, yeah, High Brazil, yeah. High Brazil. Uh, is there anything that you... Can you well, tie that into this at all? There's numerous stories in Irish mythology of the ancestors who were lost beyond the sea. So that suggests an Atlantis-type thing. Now, High Brazil did appear on maps in the Middle Ages off the southwest coast of Ireland. And it was a rumor to be an island that appeared every so often. But I'm thinking they're getting two things mixed up here. Okay. I think that the High Brazil Island that people saw from Ireland, they were actually able to see it from the coast of Ireland. It was just off the coast. An island appeared and then it vanished. The High Brazil on the maps is way out to sea. So I think that might be the Azores. They might have, because this legend was well known, not just in Ireland, but all over Europe. Uh, mariners were always talking about it. So Spanish mariners saw, probably saw the Azores or something. And, and oh, there's High Brazil. So there's, that's the mystery solved. So the map and the stories don't really add up. But yet there is the distort, the mythology of High Brazil, of the island that appears and vanishes is definitely a strong part of Irish mythology. But it was very, it was constantly noted that it was seen from the shore. It wasn't way out to sea like it's shown on the, on the Spanish and Portuguese maps from the Middle Ages, or not Middle Ages, from the, you know, from the, the great era of navigation. Right. <laughs> Jason, anything? No, I was just kind of musing over that. And that's just, it's just fascinating to me that, uh, you know, Thomas was talking about sometimes, yeah, getting, getting little bits of information from the flat earth people and that, and I'm just kind of chewing on that a little bit, but the, the one that always jumps out to me with them, uh, that I, you know, I, I don't like all the, you know, the big trees and the no mountains thing, but when they, when they talk about the mud flood, I, I, I don't think it's as they describe it, but I think that there's, there's some evidence of buildings being covered up by uh, mud or by sand because of the, when the earth does its, uh, its dance. Yeah. There's going to be parts of the planet that just, they just get covered up by, uh, you know, right. what's that called a lahar when, when, like when there's a volcano yeah. and there's just this yeah. debris of ice fr melting from uh, glaciers and everything. Like if Mount Rainier were to go right now, oh, us here in the Puget Sound region, we wouldn't get the lava flow, but we'd be screwed over by the lahar, which is just all the debris. So yeah, we're, I was just musing over that idea about, yeah, sometimes they do, they do catch on to a little bit of something and maybe there was something about that, but the, the, the rabbit hole they go down with the mud flood thing ends up taking it to yeah, the flat the earth. Mud, and, the, yeah. mud, the mud flood thing is real in terms of, yeah, there was these kind of almost pyroplastic flows of mud that happened over it. This definitely did happen. But yeah. the thing is they go and see things like uh, sub subway constructions in New York, put and cover subway constructions in London and say that this is the mud all being cleared out or being put in. And also American cities were heavily engineered when the railroads are being built. That's why you have Atlanta on the ground. That's why you have Seattle on the ground. They had raised the height of the shoreline around rivers and docks in order to facilitate modern shipping. And that's why you have this parts of these cities are underground. They're literally down there because there was a new ground level appeared. And that's the reason why buildings have half their windows buried yeah. because they were part of the, the, the new, it was like, they're like, they're like land wreck. You know, why Holland is built out of the sea. It's like American cities were like that, except they didn't build out of the sea. They raised the ground level. The same yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, they what call it, it the the Denny regrade here, where where there's a street called Denny, and they they yeah. raised up the the uh, deliberate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, there is a thing when you know if when there's a cataclysm, I'd imagine. Yeah, oh there's, yeah, like yeah. there's vast areas of the of, of Canada that has actually was massive mud floods across it, and it was animals from thousands of miles were carried. Yeah, and you know this time around they'll be they'll be. Uh, There'll be uh, truckers and people at truck stops frozen with uh, with pristine Doritos in their mouth, like the way that we found uh, woolly mammoths with little flowers. <laughs> you know, yeah. There'll be people. <laughs> so to end it on a light uh, note. It looks like we've got maybe a little bit of time for one more. So I, I did manage to pull up something. Um, if you guys kind of want to jump in and go off the cuff on just one more. Um, it's up to you guys. What do you want to do? Go on, go for it. Okay. Um, so the possible link between Amuamua and un unidentified aerial phenomena in some UAP turn out in some UAP turn out to be the extraterrestrial technology. 
They could be dropping sensors for a subsequent craft to tune into. What if a muamua is such a craft? A colleague of mine once noted that every morning there is a long line of customers stretching out from a famous Parisian bakery onto the street. I wish someone would wait for my scientific papers with as much, with as much anticipation as Parisians eagerly stand for their baguettes. There is one exception to this, however. It involves fresh scientific evidence that we are not the only intelligent species in the cosmos. Recently, there have been two sources for such evidence. First, the interstellar object discovered in 2017, Oumuamua, was interfered to have a flat shape, or inferred, I'm sorry, was inferred to have a flat shape and seemed to be pushed away from the sun as if it were a light sail. This pancake was tumbling once every eight hours and originated from the rare state of the logical standard of rest, which averages over the motions of all of the stars in the vicinity of the sun. The second, the Pentagon is about to deliver a report to Congress stating that some UAP are real, but that their nature is unknown. If UAP originate from China or Russia and we're a national security risk, their existence would have never been revealed to the public. Hence, it is reasonable to conclude that the U.S. government believes that some of these objects are not human in origin. This leaves two possibilities. Either UAP are natural terrestrial phenomena, or they are extraterrestrial in origin. Both possibilities implying something new and interesting that we did not know before. The study, the study of UAP should therefore shift from occupying the talking points of national security administrators and politicians to the arena of science where it is studied by scientists rather than government officials. Many or even most UAP might be natural phenomena, but even if one of them is extraterrestrial, might there be any possible link to a muamua? The inferred abundance of Oumuamua-like objects is unreasonably large if they're of purely natural origin. With Amaya Morrow Martin and Ed Turner, I wrote a paper in 2009 calculating the number of interstellar rocks based on what is known about the solar system. Uh, they just kind of go on to talk about a whole bunch of things uh, about their article, which we can link this if anybody wants to read all of that. Um, basically, I, I mean, again, it's, it's kind of going back to the same discussion we were having earlier with just, you know, these strange things in the sky. Uh, no one's going to come out right and say what they are, what they aren't. They can't deny them. They're pretty much confirming them. Um, yeah, I just, I thought this was, this was an interesting one um, with a little bit more information with people who had actually been uh, writing on the subject. Yeah, well, fortunately, don't knock standing in line for fresh baguettes in Paris, especially with the Never. Creme, uh, creme for that, that creme for That's my God. That's that's worth waiting for the end of the year for. So that's not honestly not for having tremendously good taste first. Uh, secondly, uh, we were just did a whole program basically on this with Ben Elmer and Jones, which will be going up at the same time as this tomorrow, so you can watch that too. Well, there's no rumor, rumor, me and Scout or reconnaissance or something like that. Maybe they uh, have mes messenger. Um, yeah. I'll look it up real quick, but go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, so it's again, this is a floating that like this a uh, rumor, rumor thing is not going to go away soon. It's it's too weird. It's too strange. I mean, the latest data comes out that it's, it's as thin as a sheet of paper. And yet it's like it's it's really wide and really long. So it could be like a solar sail of another civilization or as jason has speculated of this civilization in a previous high technology state yeah. sent down a probe that was operating on solar sails and it's come back in pieces it says uh it's a muamua is a hawaiian term for scout yeah 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 you were you were, you were right yeah I, yeah I, I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think this Oumuamua thing is really fascinating. And we mentioned the, you know, the Black Knight satellite too. And yeah, just, just to caveat off of the last show. Yeah, I, it's my opinion that, that you know, the, the, there's these cycles of civilization and, you know, we get up to being spacefaring and then something happens where there's a big coronal mass ejection or an extinction level event that's natural. It's not, you know, it's, it's not man-made global warming. It's not, you know... It's not anything that we're being told that it is, except, you know, that this kind of stuff.